morning everyone and welcome to our morning broadcast here at the Welcome Evangelical Church. Again, for you that are watching on, that have got up this morning and, and have taken the time now just to, to listen in, we really do pray that it will be a blessed time for you. And uh, let's just fellowship together and praise the Lord and enjoy his word. I'm going to start off this morning singing that lovely song, Come People of the Risen King. And it's really a call to worship the Lord, to rejoice in him, to praise him, and to give him the glory. So let's sing it. If you don't know it, you'll soon learn it. The words will be on the screen as you follow it um, from your own screen. Let's enjoy praising the Lord today. to bring him praise come all and tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of grace from the shifting shadows of the earth we will lift our eyes to him where steady arms of mercy reach to gather children way just to begin our morning service today just rejoicing in the Lord and giving him thanks and giving him praise you know as we begin our service today you know we're just again going to come before God in prayer and we're very conscious again of families that are going through bereavement 
Uh, we know that you know, death again has visited our community. And we do think of families that are really uh, struggling at this time just with you know, the battle of bereavement and also folks that are hospitalized. Uh, we continue to pray for those um, who are in hospital today that God will really draw near and uh, just, you know, just, you know, who really need our prayers. I would ask you, please, if you would remember my brother-in-law, Jim. He has been brought back in the hospital again, and we're just thinking about him this morning. So we think of others um, that are in hospital today, that God will really just meet people at the point of need. Again, we just think of our church family today, and we just pray for our church family, that God will really draw near to you at this time and just be all that you need. And uh, even our wider church family of all of the children and their families, um, and we just pray for each one, that all is safe, all is well, and that God is very much blessing each one of you. Um, it's with great joy, again, we, we announced it on Tuesday, but for those that maybe didn't click in on Tuesday night to our broadcast, um, we announced that the church here, the Welcome Church, will reopen on Good Friday, the 2nd of April at 7.30. We're going to have a communion service here and we're going to enjoy the Lord's presence together. That will then follow um, with a service on Easter Sunday, um, our first Sunday service um, from we were locked down uh, on the 4th of April uh, at 11.30. We'll be joining together and it'll be great to see folks sitting on these seats rather than looking at empty seats and staring up at a camera. It'll be great to see you again. Uh, and so we would encourage you please just to mark that date in your diary, both those dates, Good Friday at 7.30 um, and then also Easter Sunday at 11.30 on the 4th of, of April. It'll be great to see you here. Um, we will be issuing guidelines uh, as, you know, as we lead up to those particular dates, but um, we just thought we would mention that again. It'll be great to see everyone and to be able to rejoice and to praise the Lord together. I know that there are churches that are opening today. Some have decided to reopen, you know, a few weeks earlier than ourselves, but we just wanted to give ourselves those extra few weeks, especially when we think of some of the elderly folks in the church and, you know, and things like that. And so we just want everyone to be safe, everyone to be well, and to come back together. And I just think the Easter weekend is a great weekend just for us to be able to come together again and to rejoice and to praise the Lord. So we look forward to that. And so right now we're going to come before the Lord in prayer. And again, if you have a need, if there's a, an issue going on in your life, please rest assured that God knows all about it. He knows what you're going through. He knows what's happening in your life. And as I begin to pray, I want you to pray with me. And you lift your need to the Lord and we'll lift our needs together and we'll just trust him because he's a powerful God. He can do anything. And we're encouraged in the Bible to come boldly before the throne of grace and to make our petitions known. And that's what I'm about to do right now. About to lift our voice to heaven. And as we think about you, you think about us. Pray for God's blessing upon our broadcast today. And let's just trust him for the answers. Let's just pray together, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for this lovely call to worship. Come people of the risen King. Lord, thank you that we serve a risen King. We serve a risen Savior and he is in the world today. Lord, we're talking to you right now. That's how we know that you're alive, that you're living and you're the great high priest in heaven. And Lord, we thank you that you ever live to make intercession for us. And as we just stand here today, Lord, we rejoice in you. We praise you. Lord, we love you today. We, we thank you for all of your goodness and for all of your blessings upon our lives and in our lives. And as we give you thanks and as we reverence you today, as we hallow your name, as we lift up your name today, Lord, we, our thoughts go today to people that are very much in need. Lord, I do pray for families that are going through bereavement. 
And I'm asking you, Lord, because we don't take this lightly. We know that we mention families every week. But, Lord, the pain, Lord, even the rawness of, of the situation that families have faced, even in recent days, Lord, I just pray, even as death has come to your home, I'm thinking of the Calderwood family, I'm thinking of the Johnston family, and I'm asking, Lord, that you would draw near to them in a special way. I do pray for those that are in hospital today. I do think of Jim, and I pray, Lord, for him, that he will make a speedy recovery. And I'm thinking of others, Lord, who are hospitalized as well. Lord, you know the issues, you know the problems. And Lord, I just pray that you will remember each one. Lord, you know those that are listening today. Lord, I pray for our church family. I pray for our youth club. I pray for all of their families. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, that, Lord, that, that we will see light at the end of this tunnel. Lord, light to, to bring us through this lockdown, out the other side, and for some kind of normality again to return into our lives. And thank you, Lord, for keeping us safe and well. But I do pray for those, Lord, that are listening, who have a real burden, have a real problem. And Lord, as they lift that burden and problem to you right now, Lord, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus that you will draw near in a special way and that you will meet them at the point of need and that you will answer prayer. Because you are a prayer hearing and a prayer answer in God. So Lord, would you answer prayer today. Lord, we thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord, today, Lord, that your word will come alive. And Lord, that your voice will speak into our hearts. Lord, as we are reminded how much that you suffered leading up to Calvary, all that you endured, all that you went through. Lord, how that you, Lord, suffered. And even as I think of the words of that hymn writer, where it says, we may not know and we cannot tell what pain you had to bear, but we believe it was for us that you hung and you suffered there. Lord, give us a fresh glimpse today. Take away every distraction, Lord, even in our own homes. Don't let us be distracted. Let your words speak very, very clearly in the all of our hearts, and we will be careful to give you the praise in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So just before we just have our next song, I just want to remind folks that Teaching Tuesdays on a Tuesday night will be on the second um, installment, if, if that's the right way of putting it. Second part of our message, Law versus Grace. We introduced the subject there on Tuesday night, just looking at the difference between Old Testament law and New Testament grace. Do appreciate that it is a deep subject, but we trust for you that have watched on that you'll have learned something. Uh, we're just going to look at the remaining verses in Galatians chapter 3, and we just pray that God's word will again will come alive and speak very much into our hearts. So please join us on Tuesday night at 7.30, and as we open up God's word, we do pray that God will bless his word to all of our hearts. And thank you for the folks that do take the time to join with us, and that we pray that you will indeed be blessed. God bless you. So we're going to sing another song today, um, Behold Our God. We've been singing this recently, or listening to it being played. Let's enjoy it as again we continue to worship the Lord. Come let us 
Amen. That's a lovely song, and just trust that you have enjoyed just singing along and worshiping the Lord together. And really just fits in with our title this morning, our message today of our sermon, simply called Behold the Man, or Behold Your King. Taking a reading today from John chapter 19, and we're reading from verse 1 down to verse 16. So again, I would encourage you, please, just have your Bibles opened, or if you're turning on your electronic app, uh, where you're following God's Word on your iPad or your phone or whatever, let's just read God's Word and let God's Word speak to our hearts today. I'm reading from the New King James translation, uh, and you know, if you've got that translation, then you'll be able to follow the words on the screen and also uh, what I'm sharing today. So, John chapter 19, verse 1. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head 
and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And he went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover. And about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. And so they took Jesus and led him away. And we just pray today that God will bless his word to all of our hearts. The verses that we have just read this morning really describes how the, the trial of the Lord Jesus was very much in full swing. And, you know, having already looked over the previous weeks at the trial of the Lord Jesus with the Sanhedrin, and as we've seen before Pilate, and before Herod, and then here we are again, back to Pilate, you know, and, and the releasing of Barabbas, you know, it could be described without a shadow of doubt. The trial of the Lord Jesus was the greatest miscarriage of justice that there's ever been. And Pontius Pilate, he found himself in the middle of it all. And so I want you to have a look with me at verse 1, because verse 1, you know, is such a statement here. It, it tells us Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. You know, not very many words really tell us about that scourge in here. There's just, what, there's six, six words involved, you know, in that sentence. Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And what that involved, folks, let me just describe Roman scourging or Roman whipping, if it were. Let me describe it to you. The Roman scourge involved 39 lashes across the back of your body. So if you can just use your imagination just for a moment. And let me describe to you what the scourge was. The scourge actually was a leather whip. And it was knotted and it was weighted with pieces of metal and pieces of bone just intertwisted into the leather. 
And you can imagine with those bones and those metals twisted into the leather that every time the whip hit the back of the body, it would just tear off a strip of flesh from the bone. And it would cause fearful laceration. And the effects of the brutal scourging, and we're not just talking about one lash in the hands of the Roman officer. We're talking 39. It was actually 40 stripes save one. So 39 lashes, anywhere that that lash hit the back of the body, right down from the shoulders, right down to the very legs, just tearing off the flesh. Could you imagine that 39 times? And can you imagine the effects of this brutal scourging? It was so severe. I'm told that many a prisoner never survived the whipping. Some of them died instantly because of the, you know, the shock, the horror of this. Or those who did survive ended up mentally insane. How could you ever forget being tied, being held, and maybe looking up and seeing the face of this person that's standing whipping you. How difficult that would be. Every lash upon the back of the body. And to think that the sinless Son of God was subject to such cruelty. Innocent as he was, yet treated as though he was guilty. And the point is, folks, that he did this for us. He did this for you and for me. He went through this. And if that wasn't bad enough, what we see just tucked into that one sentence, Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. He physically didn't do it himself. He got a Roman officer to do it for him. But then we're told after this, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they put on him a purple robe. Again, let me just try and describe this to you because we see here how the Roman soldiers, how that they had their fun with their mock coronation prior to the Lord Jesus being crucified. You know, if we were to go way back to the seedbed of the Bible, Way back to the book of Genesis, in chapter 3, verses 17 to verse 19, you will learn that sin had brought thorns. When we think about the origin of sin, you know, after Adam and Eve and, and all that happened then, you know, sin had brought thorns and thistles into this world. And thorns were a symbol of a curse upon the sin of mankind. And so it was fitting when we think about thorns that the king of the universe, he wore a crown of thorns as he bore the sins of the world in his own body on the cross. He became a curse for us as we shared on Wednesday night looking at Galatians chapter 3. How you know, how he became a curse for us. And he became a curse for us that we might wear a crown of glory. Purple, you know, thinking now of the robe. Purple was the color of royalty. And so the robe that the soldiers put on the Lord Jesus was all part of their mockery with the crown of thorns and with the robe. And you know, with this mockery, there came, let me describe it to you, it was like a game of Roman style punching and slapping with the Lord Jesus being blindfolded and the soldiers would hit him as hard as they could. And then they would remove the blindfold. And if the prisoner was still conscious, he was to guess which of the soldiers, and there was normally between four or six of them, he was to try and guess Which soldier didn't hit him? And obviously the soldier, being blindfolded, he could never guess the right one. And so the whole thing would start all over again until the prisoner was beaten to a pulp. No wonder Isaiah prophesied 750 years beforehand in chapter 52, verse 14, where he said, 
Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage or his appearance, and he's referring to the Son of God or to the crucified one, his visage, his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. How solemn, folks, it is today for us to think that the eternal Son of God was being beaten by the hands of his creation or his creatures. You see, what we're trying to do so far, we're trying to paint the picture prior to his crucifixion, how the Lord suffered. This was no picnic, folks. The scourging, the crown of thorns, the beaten, the blindfolded, all of this, he physically suffered. Remember, folks, he was God in a body. As he walked this earth, how the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he knew what it was like there to feel the pain and suffering and agony. And he was doing all of that because of his love for you and for me. You know, we should take a moment and just thank him. We should take a moment and just praise him. How he took our sins and our sorrows and he made them his very own. And he bore the burden to Calvary, where he suffered and died alone. And coming back to the story here, folks, Pontius Pilate, he looks on at this figure before him. He looks on at this scourged, this battered, this bruised figure. He looks on at this figure with the flesh hanging down from his back. And those open sores, those blood wounds. And he looks on at him and he claims his innocence and he says, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. And his words, instead of producing a little drop of pity in the hearts of the onlooking crowd. You know, for the Lord Jesus, it only produced the opposite effect. It actually aroused their hateful passions for him. Even more as Pilate declared these words. Behold the man. And as he looks on at this man, it's as if he's shown this man to the onlooking crowd and he's saying to them, Behold the man or behold this pitiful sight of an individual That's before you. Behold the man. And you know today folks. The Lord Jesus is more than a man. He's the son of God. He's the saviour of the world. And what do we see about this man today? We've just condensed this into three headings. I would like you to write these headings down. Underline them. And think about them during the course of the day. First of all, in his life, he was the most tremendous man who has ever lived. You know, from his supernatural birth to his marvelous ministry here upon this earth, where for three and a half years he literally took Palestine by storm. Palestine didn't know what hit it. When the Son of God began his ministry here on this earth, he gave sight to the blind, he brought cleansing to the lepers, he healed the sick in body, and he even brought life to the very dead. Palestine knew that God was in their midst through the ministry of God's Son. And I'll tell you, folks, nobody ever came before him and ever went away the same. Any encounter with Christ was a life-changing encounter. There has never been or will ever be anyone like the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that Wikipedia, in recent years, they recently ran a poll. Who was the most influential person in history? And they actually compiled the list. They actually started off with 50. And then they brought it down to 10. 
And then the, the list of 10 most influential people in history. You know, there's some people there, like Napoleon. Some will say he was one of the most influential people. Adolf Hitler, one of the most influential people. Um, and others that were mentioned. But who tops the list? None other than the Lord Jesus himself. And you know, when I read that, folks, I read that list and, and, and there he was at the top. But really, he shouldn't be at the top because, see, in the sense, forget about the other 10, forget about the other 50, because the Lord Jesus had no rival. He is the Son of God, the risen, living Son of God, who has no rival and who has no equal upon this earth. What a wonderful saviour he is. Oh, folks, in his life, he was the most tremendous man who's ever lived. No doubt about that. But secondly, in his death, he was the most courageous man who has ever lived. I know that there have been many brave men and women down through the centuries and they have shown great courage in the face of death and adversity. There's no doubt about that. You know, today I'm thinking of the many Christians. I'm thinking of Christians who have been martyred for their faith. I'm thinking of Christians down through the years. And if anyone has ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs, or if you read down through from the early church right through to now, Listen, when we read of the horrific stories of people who were burnt at the stake, some of them endured horrific deaths. There's no doubt about that. Even coming to a closer, you know, era where we think of the history of troubles here in our province and, and we think of people of the armed the, uh, or the security forces that we have read about. We think of the world wars, <coughs> the First and the Second World War. We think of those people you know, who were in the trenches there at the Somme and how they lost their lives, people in the Second World War, the various conflicts since that. You know, we have heard about, we have read about, we have watched their inspiring stories. People of great courage who have laid down their lives for our country's freedom. And we thank God for them. But what sets the Lord Jesus apart from these people? these great people. This is what sets him apart. It's the fact that when the Lord Jesus died on the cross at Calvary, he was taking upon himself the sins of the world because this world needed a savior. And here's the point, folks, today. Somebody sinless would become sin for us. You see, if the Lord Jesus could have sinned, he would have been just like you and me. So what would have been the point of him going through the pain of Calvary, going through all of this? If he could sin just like you and me, you know, in respect, and you know, he would have been able to do nothing for us. But the fact that he was sinless and that he was spotless, and the Bible describes him as holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. Because of that, he made a way for every one of us how that we could all be brought back to God. Jesus made a way. Not religion, folks. Today, we're not following a religion. We're not following a man-made set of rules. We're following the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our Lord. He is our King. He's the one that we're trusting in today. Not in any religion. Not in any religious tag that we may have been born with and have no say in it. Today we're following Him. We're following Christ. And He was the one who made a way where every one of us could, could be brought back to God, to God. And the Lord Jesus, He willingly provided that way. Through his sacrificial death. Listen, his death wasn't accidental. It was sacrificial. And we can see those hands. We can see those feet. We can see him being pierced and being hung on a cross. Hanging there between two thieves for six hours that Friday. 
And he cried out those words, It is finished. The debt is paid in full. With a victor's shout of triumph. And he did all of that because he loved you and he loved me. What a saviour today. Listen, take a moment and just give him thanks. Worship him, praise him. Yes, the most courageous man who has ever lived. In his death, the most courageous man that has ever lived. Thirdly and finally, in resurrection, he is the most powerful man who has ever lived beyond the grave. I want you to think about these words that he also said in John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 17 and verse 18. He says, Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. You see, on the third day after the Lord's death, on Good Friday, on the third day, and we think about Easter Sunday, and we're looking forward to those in the next few weeks, to those dates coming, where we can celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. On the third day, the Lord Jesus rose again from the dead. Folks, today, death couldn't hold him. And after 40 days... He ascended back to heaven and to home and one day he will return to this earth. And I want you to grab this today, folks. The Lord Jesus Christ, through his death, burial and resurrection, he defeated death, hell, the devil with his demons and the grave when he came out of that tomb alive. Behold the man. What a man. What a man. Yes, the man who stood there in front of those group of people with the flesh hanging down of his back, with the crown of thorns, with that robe, all of that, all of the trappings. Yes, behold the man, but what a man today. And I can assure you that there's no sin that's too great, that there's no addiction too hard for him to break, Am I speaking to somebody here today beyond this camera and you're struggling with a real addiction? I'm encouraging you today, turn to Jesus. Because there's no addiction that's too hard for him to break. There's no sin that's too big for him. There's no problem that he can't solve. And there's no heart that's too hard that he can't soften. Maybe I'm speaking to a heart today that's, that's really hard. Maybe I'm talking today, there's somebody listening to me today, and you're a backslider. You know the way of salvation, but you have allowed your heart to go hard. And you could turn around and you could say, well, this happened to me. This is the reason why I drifted. I drifted because somebody hurt me in church, or I had a row with the minister, or I fell out with this one or that one or whatever. I'm I'm telling you folks today, Jesus has done nothing on you. And if you've hardened your heart today, he can soften your heart. If you will allow him to do so. You know, if we've had an issue in a church, we can move. We can go somewhere else. This country's full of churches. <laughs> we can move on. And I'm focusing today because there are folks that even are listening on today and our hearts are hard. And we we'll need that heart softened today. And the Lord loves you more than what you'll ever know. And he wants you to return home again. And just like the unsaved person with all of these issues and battles, he wants you to come just the way you are with your issues, with your problems, and to leave them there with him and let him sort them out. You know, today, today surely this man, behold the man. Yes, the man that stood there that day, probably physically even struggled to stand because of what he went through. Surely this man is worth following today. I'm not asking you to follow a religion. I'm not asking you to follow a church. 
or even a preacher. I'm asking you to follow Christ. I'm pointing you to Christ because he is the only one that's worth following today. Behold the man. Then I want you to notice something else in verse 14. And here we have this scene. It's 12 noon. And Pilate is at this place known as the pavement or Gabbatha. And this place was the place of Roman justice. <laughs> there certainly wasn't very much of it in offer. Sure there wasn't. Not concerning the Lord Jesus. And it was at this place of Roman justice where Pilate said to the Jews, Behold your king. Slightly earlier it was, Behold the man. Now he said to them, Behold your king. You see, the people and Pilate, and when I say the people, you know, in the mixture of those people, there was religious officials there, chief priests. And the people and the religious establishment and Pilate, they had to make a choice. A choice had to be made. And, and really, let's be honest about it, it was them who was on trial, not the Lord. <laughs> they were on trial. What choice would they make? Would it be King Jesus? Behold your king, or would it be Caesar? And they made their dreadful choice. Crucify him. And Pilate says to the crowd, Shall I crucify your king? And the reply comes back, We have no king but Caesar. You see, folks, today, every man, every woman, we must make a choice. We can't sit in the fence regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't sit on the fence. What decision will you make today? What decision will you make? You know, from the human standpoint, the trial of the Lord Jesus, as I said at the beginning, it was the greatest miscarriage of justice that there has ever been. Both the governor and the people, they failed miserably. That's from a human point of view. And I'm sure any, any lawyer, any barrister, you know, that would really have a look through this whole trial. You know, when you think of all, all of the, the, the godlies of it and all of the, the illegal trial and the trial by night, all of it, it was a real miscar miscarriage of justice. That's from a human point of view. And any good QC or good judge would pick holes right through this. But from a divine point of view, <laughs> I'll tell you something. It was the fulfillment of prophecy. It was the fulfillment of God's word and the accomplishment of God's will. Verse 16 reminds us, then he, then Pilate, delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and they led him away. And they led him away to die a sacrificial and a substitutionary death. Where he would become an offering for sin. Where he would take your place and my place on the cross. Yes, they would lead him away. And we'll describe it more in detail next week. Where we see that, gro that cross being placed across them. And how he would be led away. How he would walk down that Via Della Rosa. It's called the way of suffering. It's a narrow passageway that would lead people out to the, to the, the execution place. Calvary. And we see someone being introduced to the story. And how the Lord Jesus and his weakness physically had to lay down that crossbeam and somebody would pick it up and carry it for him. Because the stand of the cross was waiting for him at the execution site. 
The person who would stop and who would be called out of the crowd to help him was a man called Simon of Cyrene. We'll find out more about him next week. But let me just close today, folks. There he is being led away, fulfilling prophecy, right through the Old Testament, And here we are under the Gospels and we see the Lord Jesus fulfilling the word of God. Here he is, the sacrificial, the the substitutionary lamb of God, becoming an offering for sin, taking your place, taking my place on on the cross. May we behold the man today. May we behold him. We've sung it earlier on there. Behold our God seated on the throne. Come let us adore him. Behold the man. May we behold the man today and say that he is my king. That he is my king. King of my life. I crown you now. Thine be, may the glory be. Can you say that today? That he's your king. You are my king. I pray that we will trust him. Let me just close. Let me just pray. Before we sing our next song, just wherever you are, just bow your head with me, please. Let me just pray with you. Because I want to give you an invitation. As we have thought about the suffering of our Savior and all that he went through, And you know, Christian, if you're still watching on, you pray. You pray. You pray for somebody today that's maybe watching on that isn't saved or who's a backslider. And you pray that God will just take the scale of their eyes, open up their heart, and know that they will just come to know the Lord today and acknowledge him as their king. I just want to give you an invitation. Right now, wherever you are, whether you're sitting on top of your bed or whether you're in your living room sitting on a sofa or you're out in your kitchen following on, wherever you may be, if you're not a Christian, I'm inviting you today to behold the man and to make this man your king. Invite him into your life. Let him save you right now. Or if you're a backslider nursing that hardened heart, listen, it's time to come home today. Why don't you come home? Come home. Recommit your life afresh. Reconnect once again to the King of Kings. To the believer this morning, as we have listened on and as we have had a fresh reminder of all that Jesus suffered in order to purchase our redemption. Can we not just give him thanks? Can we not just praise him? Can we not just worship him? I'm just going to pray. Lord, we thank you for all that you endured. We praise you for all that you went through. That horrific scourging. Being blindfolded, being mocked, being marred. This was all prior to your crucifixion. And you went through all of this because of your love for us. Lord, we do love you today because you first loved us. Lord, you're the one that took the initiative. Lord, we could never have loved you of ourselves. As we often sing here, when I couldn't come to where you were, you came to me. Lord, we could never have came in a thousand years of ourselves. But Lord, you took the initiative and you put the love in our hearts that has drew us, Lord, to repentance and brought us to salvation. Lord, we thank you for it. And as a company of your people, wherever we are right now, wherever we're listening from, Lord, we worship you, we lift you up and we praise you and we thank you that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Thank you for all that you went through to purchase our redemption. And Lord, right now we crown you with many crowns, the Lamb upon the throne, 
and we lift your name on high. Receive our thanks for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's sing that hymn right now. Follow the words. Crown him with many crowns. trust that you have crowned him today lord of all listen folks as we just close our broadcast right now again i'm encouraging you please um just if you have today been really convicted and you've put your faith and trust in the lord or you've been restored back to that first love experience again please let us know we we would love to hear um of what has happened in your life today and all you need to do is send us a private message and we will rejoice with you as the angels in heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents. And so, listen, be blessed today. Be encouraged. Think about all again the price that Jesus paid, the Lord Jesus paid for all of us on the cross. And just go through this day and just rejoice and give him the praise. And we look forward to seeing you on Tuesday night. Again, join with us. Um, for Teaching Tuesdays. God bless you. Enjoy the beginning of your week and we'll see you on Tuesday night.